What's the word, y'all? I think I just watched Sammy Ozile get a bucket in this Clippers versus Knicks game. Legitimately had no idea Sammy Ozile played for the Clippers. When did that? Okay, I, this is not what this video is supposed to be about, but I need to know. How many games does he have under, under his belt as a Clipper? The answer is four. I'm sorry, Clippers fans. I guess I ain't really been tuned in. What a weekend for the association, man. We already talked about yesterday LeBron James dropping 56 against the Golden State Warriors and how incredible that is. I saw this morning that if LeBron James drops 30 in his game tomorrow, then he'd be number one in points per game this season, which is insane considering, again, he's 37 years old. Either way. Yesterday was a nice day, and then and then today got even better. Now, I know your weekend is probably consistent of you going out shopping, hanging out with friends, maybe going to see the new Batman movie. I ain't done that just yet. I, ain't, I don't do those things. So my Sunday consisted of waking up, editing the video, and then watching Jason Tatum drop 54 before everybody else was out of church. Why does the NBA consistently do this on Sundays where the first game starts so very early? Jason Tatum, complete master class. And then I waited. And the very next game, Chris Middleton dropped 44 against the Suns. And then I waited. And then Chris Stapps Rizingas came back from his injury. looked really good in that five minutes that I watched of this game. And then I waited. And then I saw Scotty Barnes versus Evan Mobley, where Evan Mobley dropped 20 and 17. And then I waited, and Jokic dropped 46, 12, and 11, where he scored 30 points between fourth quarter and overtime. And I, y'all, I cannot make up my damn mind every single day. My MVP is different. You could probably guess where I'm going with this one, who my MVP is right now. But I got to talk to you about a sponsor, which is, of course, Prize Picks. Hit that link in the description, download the Prize Picks app, and use code Kenny because you're matching up to $100 deposit for all new players. Again, it just has enhanced my way of watching basketball. It is just you versus the numbers. So you pick four to five of your favorite players, and you pick over and under on different stats. We got points, rebounds, assists, and so on and so forth. Like, how satisfying is it that you see that Jason Tatum is going against the Brooklyn Nets, and you just know he's going to have a killer game, and he dropped 50 for you? Boom, your entry might have just hit the green. One of my favorite things is seeing all y'all hit me up and say, hey, Kenny, I, I use Code Kenny, and this is how it's going, and it's going great. So go ahead and join the thousands of people that have already used Code Kenny and download the Prize Picks app. Enter that code, and they're matching up to $100 deposit for new players. Again, Prize Picks, we appreciate you. I've never really been this indecisive about something basketball related. The closest thing I've had to this is the year that Russell Westbrook won his MVP, but even this season is, a, is even more difficult. Like, as early as Saturday, somebody asked me who my MVP is, and, and it was on the podcast. And I always preface this by telling you the exact date and time that I'm saying this. So, for example, if you ask me right now, March 6th, 11, 18 p.m., my MVP is Nikola Jokic. Now, I've had so many different people as my MVP at certain times. Steph Curry is my MVP early in the season. Kevin Durant had a time as my MVP. Giannis had his time as my MVP. Then Jokic had a time as my MVP. Then Joel Embiid took it. And now Jokic, in my opinion, just took it back. If I was a media player per person and I had a vote right now on March 6th, I would give it to Nikola Jokic. And yes, it could be that simple as somebody having one amazing game that can sway me in one other way. And I've, I've, I've been this way for these two players for like two to three seasons now where somebody asked me, who was the best center in the league? Sometimes I'll, ask, I'll answer Joel and sometimes I'll answer Jokic. I hate comparing the two because it's like apples to apples. Like both of them are just so very good that you can make an argument for each of them being the dude and I could not tell you you're wrong. Right now my MVP is Nikola Jokic because what he did against the Pelicans today was absolutely ridiculous now early into this game they were dominating and i made a conscious effort to try to watch this entire game and i'm so happy that i did not tune out because uh like i mentioned in yesterday's video pelicans fans were hitting me up kenny you got to talk about us you got to talk about us and i was like you know what okay let me sit down and watch the entirety of your game and they started off very dry nicole Jokic came out tip off easy bucket assist easy bucket assist easy bucket it was just at ease and i was like oh snap the pels ain't gonna really put up a fight and then they did coach mike malone gets ejected because the pelicans are coming back and then the the officiating, and I'm gonna say this for both sides, was pretty ass this game. I'm just gonna be, I'm just gonna be honest. It was, it was bad. It was bad both ways. And, and again, I ain't got no, no, no dog in this fight. So that's just me telling you the way it is. Mike Malone gets, um, I almost said Mike Malone got executed instead of ejected. I need to get more sleep. He gets ejected, and in that time, they were down by like 10 or 12 points. And sometimes we see this, and even they were they were talking about this on the broadcast, where like some coaches get ejected, and they use that as the fuel 
to get the team to play well because they they had started off very good, start to look terrible, and Mike Malone got ejected and he was like, "I right, we got it. we got to do this for Coach Michael Malone," and they did. And then the fourth quarter came around and Nikola Jokic was as unguardable as I've ever seen him be, and that's saying a lot. He was unguardable as I've ever seen him be. And you know what? It made me go dig up this old video, and I'll pay, play a clip of this. For reference, I made this video in November of 2018, and this happened to be the year that Nikola Jokic got his first all-star appearance. But but look look at what I said in this video. First of all, don't don't pay attention to the way I look and stuff like that. Come on, I've grown a lot since 2018. But just think, listen to what I say and come back. Can we take this time to talk about Jokic right now? Listen, Jokic, you have the offensive tools to average 22 at least. There is no reason for you to attempt one shot in the game. Last night against Memphis, he attempted one shot. But instead of showing how good he is when scoring the ball, he's too passive. Also, that jersey that was on a hanger is now over here now. Look at look at me. I, I travel with the same stuff. Um, it's just crazy how things have, have changed. And yes, every once in a while, Nicole Jokic does have the game where you're like, bro, can you please just take over? Because nobody can guard you. Like, it actually happened a couple nights ago. And luckily for them, they still won. We had like eight points. And you were just waiting for like the Jokic moment to happen. But it's it's it happens way less likely now or way more less often now than it did then. It's just him growing up and just being better and more conscious about how good of a player he is. If I was an NBA player, which obviously I'm very, very far away from it, I like the way Nicole Jokic kind of does his thing. He goes into work. He plays basketball. He goes home and he plays Counter-Strike or he plays League of Legends or he plays Apex. And then that's... That's, that's what it is. He doesn't have so a social media uh, bone in his body. It's just basketball, elite level basketball, MVP level basketball. Go home to my wife and my daughter, and I'm going to play a little bit of League of Legends. <laughs> just, just amazing schedule. And, and the reason I'm so fascinated with him and Joel Embiid is because they don't get easy looks whatsoever. It's a lot easier to throw a double team at a center than it is a guard that's saucing up. You know what I'm saying? So these dudes do not get a lot of easy looks in their life. So the fact that they're both so very elite at what they do is just mind-blowing to me. And I still think the defense that he's putting together uh, or getting better at every single season is still underrated. I think people still think of him as a negative defender when he's very far away from that. He's got some of the most active hands in the entire NBA. And they're saying something about a dude that doesn't have a lot of speed. A really good active hands. He gets blocks or just great rim protection. No, you know what? I, I'm going to do this again. If, if you've been around the channel for a while, you know that I believe that there's a difference between a rim protector and a paint protector. A rim protector is, well, Rudy Gobert is both, and that's what makes him elite. But a rim protector, in my opinion, is like Hassan Whiteside, a dude that'll get you a lot of blocks. A paint protector could be like Al Horford or even Robert Williams. Robert Williams has a case to be both. Nicole Jokic is a paint protector more than he is a rim protector, but every once in a while he'll surprise you, and that's how he's got uh, the three game-winning blocks this season. Or in this game, he's, I think he ended with three blocks as well. Yeah, he ended with four blocks and three steals. Nicole Jokic, man. Nicole Jokic, man. Nicole Jokic, man. I, and... I just I hate that that he is one of the more I don't know I don't want to say disrespected because I I do believe that I personally use the word disrespected very often um, I I don't know if people disrespect Nikola Jokic actually yes people do yes yes the, the the Nick Wrights of the world are very disrespectful to Nikola Jokic when in reality bro just flat out can hoop where you can roll the balls out with him and four of the dudes and he's going to find a way to make you competitive enough to to be not in the play in think about the lineups that this team has been running the entire season let me let me read you the lineup that they've been running for most of the season let me let me just let me just showcase it they won this game with Monte Morris, Will Barton, Aaron Gordon, Jeff Green and Jokic off the bench, they had Brent Forbes, Jermichael Greed, Bose Highland, Boogie, who tonight wasn't great, but Boogie just had a crazy game the other night, which is amazing. This roster has no business being as good as they are, and the reason they're as good as they are is because of the guy that's in the middle. I don't know, man. I just I love watching the Colyokes play, and as of right now, and it is now uh, March 6th, 1127, he is still my MVP. We'll see what it looks like in six hours from now. Or even 24 hours from now, because I believe that um, Joel Embiid goes against the Bulls, and Joel Embiid makes the Bulls look like kids every single time he plays against them. So maybe he takes it back. I'm not sure. Jason Tatum versus the Brooklyn Nets. Um, I've I've said everything there is to say about the Boston Celtics, whether it be on this channel 
or my TNT segment. Nothing has really changed whatsoever. I'm still impressed every single game if they win. But I, I more want to focus my attention to the Brooklyn Nets because well, I, I saw something after this loss that said they were 3-17 and 17 in their last 20, which is the same as the Houston Rockets. The Houston Rockets won today against one of the best teams in the league. Shout out to Christian Wood. Um, Jalen Green played really well, and Kevin Porter Jr. You know what I'm saying? Sometimes you have those nights where all three of them have a good game, and that was tonight, and they ended up winning this one. So shout out to them. But 3-17 and 17 at any point in the season for a team that, that has the aspirations of winning the championship is completely unacceptable. I don't think I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm not uh, um, breaking any news by saying that. 3-17 and 17 at any stretch is unacceptable. Um, and I understand that Kevin Durant missed a huge chunk of that, and he's only, I think it's his second game back, and he still looks like Kevin Durant. It's so, so crazy to me. Um, a guy like Kevin can miss six weeks of basketball to still come in and still look like one of the best players in the world. But the rest, everything around him is just whack. Um, even after this game, Coach Ime Yudoka said something along the lines of like, we don't really think about the defense versus the Brooklyn Nets because they're not running anything complex, which is just basically saying that the Brooklyn Nets play iso ball. It's like Kevin's turn, then Kyrie's turn. And, and Ree, um, Ree just had such a bad game, bro. I know he ended with 19 and 6 and 4. It, 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 he was not in positively impactful in this game. And it was just a six-point game, and a lot of that was Kevin Durant. A lot of that was Bruce Brown and LaMarcus Aldridge hitting his shots. Kyrie Irving was not that much of a factor. And in my mind, and we talked about this on our podcast today because we were ranking the, du the duos in the NBA. In my mind, the combination of Kevin Durant and Kyrie Irving wasn't losing a lot. And I think a, a lot of that is because the last memory I have of them playing together is a lot to do with uh, the um, Milwaukee Bucks series where they were stellar. But in reality, that duo has not played well together. And I thought I screenshot at the stats, but I did not. I, I definitely screenshot at this one that they are 5-11 and 11 with Kyrie Irving in the lineup this season. Um, and I know a lot. some of those are like without James and without Kevin, but still an alarming statistic. Um, and the fact that they're a play-in game or play-in team, anything can happen once you're in a play-in. It's only a one to two game depending on where your seating is and anything can happen. And I want to give them benefit of the doubt because Kevin Durant is the type of dude that can give you 50 when, and play 48 minutes if you need him to like he did in the playoffs last last year. But like that that last piece, the big three piece, don't we don't know when he's going to play. Kyrie Irving only has like seven, eight more games left of the season, depending on if the vaccination thing changes. And it just feels like a team that we were thinking about next year more than next year as them being like title winners, potentially. Now, I know a lot can change in a short amount of time. And, and maybe what I'm saying right now is completely washed in a week's time because they won a, a three to four game winning streak. But right now, it's, it's not looking great. And the top post on the Go Nets subreddit says that Kyrie Irving shouldn't be a net next year. I am personally of the mindset that Kyrie shouldn't be here next year regardless of what happens the rest of the season. Look at the story between the two scenarios. Either the Nets wake up and run to a chip winning despite their star actively sabotaging the season or they don't win the chip slash miss the playoffs and Kyrie was instrumental in the season being destroyed. We can sit here and make a thousand excuses of why we are good but the main problems all tied to one thing. Nets don't have chemistry due to their lack of star point guard, shooter guard in and out of the lineup all season. James Harden left the team due to Kyrie's part-time status. Our players are playing high minutes and getting exhausted slash injured because a healthy body who could take some of those minutes and help balance the load is choosing to sit out. I don't care whether or not the mandate is stupid or unfair. Life isn't fair. Almost all the teams sacrifice instead of Kyrie. Even when we have Kyrie on the floor, sometimes he doesn't even play well. Today he had 19 points on 8 of 18 shooting. As a superstar, that's just flat out unacceptable. If I'm Sean Marks in the offseason, I'm sitting with Kyrie and giving him the ultimatum. Either you can resign with us for a much, <laughs> much lesser contract with clauses built in to protect the team from stuff he pulls. Because remember last year, there was no mandate and Kyrie just willingly just left the fucking team for weeks at a time. Or you agree to give Kyrie the contract he wants but a sign and trade. I'm tired of the Kyrie era, and that has 245 upvotes, and it was the number one most upvoted thing today. Um, granted, it is just seven hours ago, which is like right after the loss, and I know that the emotions at an all-time high after a big loss on national TV, but um, a, a, a write-up by Neiman Smith, and the top comment says, well, he has a player option. <laughs> so, yeah, he's probably going to take that. But um, even Nets fans are upset with the Kyrie Irving thing. Cash money Chris with a 44 piece. But you know what? Shout out to Chris Middleton. He deserves his flowers. All-star player, all-star player. Um, but I want to give my flowers to Drew Holiday because he went into the fourth quarter with seven points 
And uh, by the end of it, uh, he ended up having you know, did a 24. Yes, Chris Middleton had some of the biggest shots down the stretch, but Drew Holiday is one of the reasons why they stood afloat and they stayed in the game. Because Giannis obviously was not having a great one. I think in the first half, he I think in the first half he had 17, and the second half he had two. Um, they did it. They did a very good job of of guarding Giannis in this one, and he stayed in foul trouble. Um, but it was the Chris Middleton Drew Holiday thing, and I'm I was super impressed by this one. I I mean. I'm impressed by the Suns more than the <laughs> I'm impressed by the Suns more than Milwaukee because the Suns were missing their two All Stars and still stuck around in this one. Um, but the thing that you're gonna learn about the about the uh, Giannis led Milwaukee Bucks at least this season is they gonna play to their competition every single night. Some of these games they should be blowing teams out and they just don't. But they'll turn it up in that last couple minutes. You're like, oh, okay, here he is. DeAndre Aiden putting up 30 points is great. I still and I'm gonna say this about DeAndre Aiden until he fix it. I've been saying this is his rookie season. I need my boy to get his free throw rate up because two free throw attempts as a starting center where he ended up with 30, unacceptable. Uh, it's super exciting that he ended up with 30 points and one free throw. I mean, because. <laughs> You think about some of the other centers in the league to get 30 points. You need a couple, you know what I'm saying? You need more free throws than that. Um, but I guess it's all about the growth as a player because I think he's only 21 years old or something right now. Or he's 23? Why do, Why am I always so under, like, when it comes to age? It's so hard. He's 23, which is still um, still very young in the NBA world. Um, he needs to get better at John Faust, that's all. He's a guy that, he's a finesse uh, center, though. He's not a guy that loves a bunch of contact. It's like hook shots, floaters, and things like that. Go in, uh, you got them, you got those muscles, bro. Go ahead, draw a couple. Do have anything else to say? Like, there were other games that I watched, like Porzingis' first game. I watched a five-minute stretch, and then they pulled him, and I was like, oh, okay, Porzingis looks cool. Um, and, and it's just about keeping Porzingis healthy more than anything, and he was running, like, five-minute stretches, and he looked all right. I don't even know who won this game. Oh, was, um, Washington won this game, and he ended up with 25, so there's that. I think Kuzma had his fifth straight game of putting up 20 plus, and the Rockets won a game against the Grizzlies. Not very great for the Grizzlies to lose this one, especially since they had just taken over the two seed. And I would guess that that dropped them back to the three seed. The Jazz beat the Thunder. That's about ex expect expected as uh, anything. And then the most uh, disturbing news from today's slate of games is that uh, Jared Allen is going to be out indefinitely because he broke his finger. Watching his game and, and he got need in the quad and they were like he won't return. So you imagine the surprise of everybody when when they tweeted, Oh, he's out of definitely with a broken finger. I'm like, bro, didn't he get need in the leg? Why is, how did that break his finger? Two different plays, I guess. His finger's broken and a team that has been riddled with with injuries and and I don't know. Cause anytime you start to talk about teams that have missed games, it's always that one um Orlando Magic fan that bring up that that graphic, like it, that's heavily skewed because Markel Fos missed uh, like two years of basketball, it feels like, and John Isaac missed a bunch of time. But like when it comes to players that were expected to play this season, the Cavaliers have lost many players. Um, so it's just bad for them of them having a breakout season and one of their all-stars is just out now. They still ended up winning this game because Evan Mobley decided to turn up. And you know what? If there's any, anything interesting about this, I'm interested to see how they start next game. Who's going to be in the start lineup? Do they move Mobley over to the five? Or do they let Ed Davis, who played a couple minutes in this one, start all of a sudden? I'm not completely sure what they're going to do. But I, I, I think the idea of Evan Mobley running some more five or starting at the five could be interesting, um, interesting for me as a fan. That's all. Recaps usually aren't supposed to be this long, but I think we spent a lot of time on the Brooklyn Nets. I, it, who cares, right? It's my show.